got everything pulled up, so yeah, I'm uh, I'm good to go whenever. All righty, then. Uh, let me let everybody know that we're here before I do anything else. Oh, really? You're not... You refreshed my page. Thanks a lot. So are we doing the top five next week? Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, okay, you put it in the notes. Yeah. Yeah. I make a new little post here. Let me go to my YouTube studio and get the link. I just want to make a Facebook post that we're here. So if you're watching on YouTube, hi there. What's up, Joey? Joey's in the chat room with us. Joey. Joey. Get that shareable link, son. There we go. And now. No one wants those non-shareable links. Yeah, you don't they want suck. those. Those those will take you nowhere. Top five toilet paper brands. <laughs> 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 hey, that's something, if I was to write a book on the things I've learned in my life, is never skimp on the toilet paper. Nope. Just go ahead and pay those extra bucks. Uh, there's two things in this world that you get what you pay for. <laughs> Video production and toilet paper. Yep. Because if you get if you go to cheap route, you pay for hemorrhoids. That's what you get with cheap toilet paper. <laughs> All right, Top gonna... five dinosaur chicken nuggets. <laughs> uh, hey, Stegosaurus are... is my those are Stegosaurus good. is my one through five. Oh yeah, absolutely. All right, well I'm ready to get this show on the road. What do you say? Yeah, I mean we're we're here, so we might as well. Yeah, might as well. All right, here we go. Three, two, one. programs and we're back for another episode of the nerd cave retro show my name is jason robbins and my name is derek diamond and uh we're discussing the 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 our our top things to do as as an adult in this world in the the chat room and uh, one of those things is never skimp on the toilet paper kids always go for that good two ply if you skimp on toilet paper, chances are that will be the only time that you do it. Well, I am one half of your host, Jason Robbins. <laughs> and I am the other half, Derek Diamond. So I watched the entire Fallout series this weekend. I am not a Fallout fan. I, I've never really been a big fan of the games. They never really did anything for me or captured me. But I loved that TV show. You know, I I'm right there with you. I've never played a Fallout game. I've never really been that interested, if I'm being honest. But I've heard overwhelmingly positive things about the show. Even people that aren't fans of Fallout have said that the show is really good. It's just a really good show. I mean, I don't know what else to say. Like, first off, Walton Goggins is is worth the 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 admission price alone. Like that dude. I love him in everything I've ever seen him in. And I keep forgetting that he's in that show, um, Righteous Genstones. So that's my next show I'm going to start literally just because of him. I, I would watch that dude do anything. Righteous Gemstones is so good. You'll love it. Oh, yeah, Joey. But you have to watch Fallout because it's... I think you'll really like it. I actually think if, if you're not a fan of the games, I think watching the show will actually make you think twice and go, hmm. Maybe I should go check out some of those other games. Well, and plus, like, you could go in with a more objective mindset because you don't know much about that universe. Like, yeah. you, if you look at season one of Halo and how divisive it was, like, we played Halo mm -hmm. when it came out. So, for us, it wasn't what it could have been. But my wife, who's never played a second of Halo, loved it. So, yeah. it's... I guess the same you could say for Fallout. But the thing about the Fallout 
show is is I all the people I've heard that love the Fallout games love the TV show too because it's not it's the the story of it is different from anything in the games but the actual world and everything about it is just a direct adaptation of the games like it looks like the games that everything in the game in the move in the show is in the games like they just basically took everything from the game and said all right well here's a story we can tell in this universe tell you we're getting into that that age where Hollywood's finally figured out how to adapt video games. Mm -hmm. I hope so, because I hope we're entering the... Uh, I feel like uh, Super Mario Brothers and The Last of Us were the, um, almost the, uh, the, the Iron Man moment of studio execs finally going, Oh, here's how you do good video game adaptations. Well, I'd give credit to Sonic 1 and 2 as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. I think Sonic laid like the foundation and then everything else has just been you know built upon it and then built upon it and continued to be built upon it. And and the thing about the Halo show is it's I don't hate it, but I don't love it either. I feel it's very mediocre. The thing is is that when we play Halo, our favorite thing to do is play as Master Chief and just beat the hell out of some aliens yeah you don't get a lot of that in season <laughs> no. one of halo you get i even before the first episode and i don't want to go on my soapbox about the first season i haven't watched the second one yet but he takes his helmet off for the end of the first episode and he's never done that in the game that's the thing like how do you have somebody like um uh, oh what's his name that plays the mandalorian um pedro pascal pedro pascal a known actor who was willing to do, you know, an entire entire season before he even showed his face. Why couldn't the Halo show be like that too? I mean, I understand actors; you want to show your face, but you're taking a role of a video game character who never shows his face. So if you don't want to show your face, why are you taking the role? Well, you know why Pedro Pascal did that, right? No. Because this is the way. I... Show's <laughs> over, everybody. Derek has bested me. <laughs> Thank you all just, for was, was almost waiting. 300 episodes. Thank you all. <laughs> uh, I It was some low-hanging fruit. I had to take it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was a good one, though. I gotta, I give you credit for that. <laughs> oh. Chuck Armstrong says helmet and armor comes off in season two. Yeah, most of season two is Master Chief running around without his armor. Like they literally wrote into the the the, the fall of reach that he his armor has been taken from him. So during the fall of reach, spoilers everybody, <laughs> reach falls uh, if you've never played the game. His, he has no armor. That that whole fall of reach. No armor. None. It's been taken from him. Like, it makes sense. But why? I, I, <laughs> I'll eventually watch it just to, so I could give my actual opinion on it. But I don't know. Just the first season really didn't do it for me. Yeah. I mean, it took me a while to get through season two. Like, I started it. Watched the first couple episodes, and then I stopped watching it for a couple of weeks, and then I ruined, went and watched a couple more episodes. It wasn't a binge for me. Like I mean, I wasn't like right there every week that it came out. It was always, you know, I'd let a couple of episodes build up and then go and watch it. But I just, I'll probably never go back and watch it again. That's how I feel about season one. Yeah. That sucks, though. I mean, it looks good. The show looks great. It's just... It's and we so had mid. such high hopes for it too. And it, like I couldn't tell you how excited I was for that first season. And as good as the Star Trek shows are, why didn't you get like a showrunner from those Star Trek shows to run it? Uh, that's above our pay grade, I guess. I guess I don't know, but uh, we got a little bit of news to get to. You ready to jump into it? We have some good video game yes. news. Yes, here we go. <laughs>
Some of tonight's stories were sent to us by Mr. Armez Jackson and Staff Sergeant Sketch. So if you have a news story you'd like to cover, send them to NerdCaveRetro at gmail.com. And I know Derek is chomping at the bit to, to get this story out. So uh, breaking news from the HollywoodReporter.com as well as multiple news outlets. Keanu Reeves joins Sonic 3 as Shadow. Keanu Reeves is speeding along to another franchise with the John Wick star heading to Sonic the Hedgehog 3. He will be voicing the popular character named Shadow, multiple sources tell The Hollywood Reporter. Uh, the news comes on the heels of a jam-packed CinemaCon presentation from Paramount last week where the studio debuted the first footage for Sonic 3. Of course, the Shadow was introduced in Sonic the Hedgehog, or not Sonic the Hedgehog, but Sonic Adventure 2, which was released in 2001. The character is in many ways the anti-Sonic, dark and edgy, while mirroring the hero's powers. So, there's a lot to unpack with this. Hmm. Like, obviously, I'm extremely excited for the news. When they announced and revealed that Shadow was going to be in Sonic 3, my top choice almost instantly was Keanu Reeves. Because if you've watched any of the John Wick movies and you think of the dialogue that he says and the way he says it, mm -hmm. and you've played any Sonic game that features Shadow, like it's perfect. It is a perfect match. And I said this in our, our group chat earlier. I have little to no doubt that after Sonic 3 comes out, there's either going to be a Shadow series or a Shadow spinoff movie. And you're going to want a big name attached to it. Mm -hmm. And Keanu Reeves is that name. Because we were talking about this before the show. Who doesn't like Keanu Reeves? Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you don't like Keanu Reeves, some that says a lot about you as a person. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So what what do you think of the news? I think it's awesome. I mean, I, has he really done very much voiceover before? I can't really think of anything. Not that I'm aware of. But he's got a pretty recognizable voice, so I, I think, you know, if he does the John Wick type of character, <laughs> I guess you'd say, like, with his voice, it's going to be perfect. Speaking of John Wick, Wick, I still haven't seen part four. I need to get on that. Yeah, I haven't either. I, I'm so far behind on movies. But another interesting nugget of info that came out during CinemaCon is it included the revelation that Dr. Robotnik, who you know we talked about Jim Carrey is mm -hmm. coming back, was depressed and out of shape after the events of Sonic 2, but gets his groove back thanks <laughs> to Shadow the Hedgehog. So Jim Carrey was right when he's... <laughs> When he was cast, he said eventually he wanted to do Fat Robotnik, and we're getting Fat Robotnik. I'm so glad that we got like, fun Jim Carrey back for these movies. Me too. I remember seeing the first Sonic on opening night, and I felt like I was watching him in Ace Ventura or The Mask or Dumb and Dumber. Like He was channeling that Jim Carrey that everyone loved in the 90s. Yep. So... Th I was already, of course, really excited about this movie, but now the anticipation level is gone way up. You oh, know, like, Joey's oh, right. He did uh, He did do a, have a character, which is sort of voiceover, but it's him, too, like his motion capture in uh, Cyberpunk 2077. I may be wrong on this, but didn't Idris Elba do some motion capture work as well? Yeah, he had a downloadable, uh, like expansion pack i think for cyberpunk that came out earlier this year or late last year so the voices of knuckles and shadow were both in cyberpunk 2077 <laughs> that's pretty cool I'll, I'll ask this question and then you know we can move on because i don't want to take up the whole show with this topic are you a little surprised that the studio didn't make the announcement themselves like they didn't do some kind of big reveal coming off of the CinemaCon presentation. I don't know. Maybe it would just be more of an impact if it came from other sources. I don't know. I don't think it takes away from anything, but I was a little surprised that, you know, with as popular as a character as Shadow is, that they didn't put together some kind of little package. Yeah. Even if it was like a 30-second to a one-minute video 
giving us like a snippet of the the Keanu voice for for Shadow, but well, it's sort of I, what's, I'm perfectly. Oh, what's go ahead. been happening lately is they do sort of like a you know a quote unquote leak. And then they're like, oh, well, we were going to save this for, you know, a certain date, but here you go. And then, like, later tonight, you know, they'll drop a, you know, a little 30-second teaser on us with 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 his voice as Shadow. So, we'll, I don't know. We'll see what happens. Yeah. I, I think we'll get the first trailer probably around June when we hit Sonic's anniversary of when the first game was released. Yeah. That that's my guess, but I'm I'm really excited for this. Yeah, I love Keanu Reeves. He can just put him in everything. He just so, yeah, he's just a absolutely. cool human. Yeah. Uh, this next story comes from our favorite site, NintendoLife.com. Sunsoft announces retro game selection for Switch English release planned. Um, let's see, Japanese company Sunsoft. I and I love Sunsoft. They need to. Bring back more old stuff. They need to re- put uh, do a re-release of the old Batman game, the Batman 1989 NES game. Oh, that'd be cool. Oh, that'd be great. Uh, and now Sunsoft is back. Retro game selection for the Nintendo Switch. It will be making its way across uh, in Japan later this month on the 18th of April. The good news is an English version is also on the way. It will be com- comprised of three Famicom titles, Wings of Madura uh, from 1986, 53 stations of the Tokaido from 1986, and Ripple Island uh, was released in 1988. There will be save and rewind functions, making games even easier to play, and there will also be a gallery mode. That's one big thing I love about uh, when they put these older games on the Switch and things like that, is the save and rewind features make these games so much more enjoyable. They do, and I even like the gallery mode as well. You know, I remember even to use another Sonic reference when they released the Sonic Mega Collection um, for, like, the GameCube and the PS2 back in the day, it almost had, like, a little Sonic museum where you could look at, like, cover arts from the games and whatnot. So I I like that this includes a gallery mode as well. I just saw Joey's comment. (laughs) I know. I was replying (laughs) I do like that top five list idea, though. Yeah. That would be pretty cool. Also from NintendoLife.com, Nintendo expands Switch Online's SNES library with three more titles. Nintendo continues to bolster its Switch Online retro library and and it's added three more titles to the Super Nintendo collection. The lineup is a little bit different as includes a few Japan-only Super Famicom releases. This includes Wrecking Crew 98, a sequel to the original NES title. I had no idea there was a sequel to Wrecking Crew. I didn't either. I had no idea. And Sunsoft's 1994 uh, Herbert fighting spinoff, Amazing Herbert. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, but somebody will correct me. Hebrek or something like that. Yeah, Hebrek. Yeah, something like that. Last but not least is Irem's Super R Type, which originally debuted on the Super Nintendo in 1991. I mean, none of them, like, they're no side pocket. Yeah. But, you know, I'm, (laughs) I'm glad that, like, the. It's an all right lineup. You yeah. know, I, I wish I say this every time that they release new Super Nintendo or NES games or whatever the console is. I wish they would do more. Yeah. But it's better than nothing. Yeah, the be... Wrecking Crew 98 intrigues me. Yeah, because I, I like like you said, I had no idea that had a sequel to it. But Super R-Type, that's something that should have been on the SNES library the minute it launched. Because that was, a, yeah. uh, I think it was a launch title. For the Super Nintendo, if I'm not mistaken. Or it was really close to the, the launch of it. Let's see. Super R-Type. Because I'm I remember, pretty sure you're right. I remember seeing um, back in, in Nintendo Power at the time when they were talking about the Super Nintendo, they, were, they always had screenshots of Super R-Type to, to promote it. Yeah, it came out very close to the launch date because yeah. the S the SNES launched at the end of August and super R type in North America. It came out September 1st of 91. Mm. So like, so it was very close. <laughs> yeah. I figured it did. It, I, I would consider it a launch title cause it practically is. Oh yeah. But yeah, I'm shocked. This wasn't on the online store. The moment it dropped, you'd think they'd release one of the first games they released for the system. On I, it. Know. I don't know what they're doing over there. <laughs> that's above our pay grade. Yeah. 
Uh, let's see. Um, and this next story uh, is, uh, or is an email from Staff Sergeant Sketch. And he says, hey, guys, I'm a bit behind on the show, and I just listened to the Sea of Stars review. I remember Jason mentioning getting the soundtrack, if it was available. I think he said on vinyl. Maybe you already knew this, but if not, and he sent us a link uh, to iam8bit.com slash collections, uh, Sea of Stars, and they have a double LP of the Sea of Stars soundtrack, and it's only $42.99. It comes in solar orange and lunar blue vinyl, and I want this so badly because <laughs> I, I actually almost started another game of this the other night. I love this game so much, and the music is mm, it's just magnificent. Yeah, I I knew you'd be a fan of this. I love the cover art for the album, by the way. It looks mm -hmm. really good. Yeah, it's like a sketch and, of the characters, and they're all watercolored and everything. It's gorgeous. And forty two ninety nine, like, isn't a terrible price. I mean, records aren't cheap. You know, we we have a mm -hmm. record store here in town, and anytime you go in there, it's like. Oh, yeah, this is why I don't own more of these. Yeah, I mean, this is what you're going to pay for an LP or a vinyl in Walmart these days. They're, they usually run about between 30 and 40 bucks, so this is actually not crazy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're going over top five <laughs> uh, topics in the, uh, the chat room, and I saw one that made me laugh. Top five Billy Mitchell lies. <laughs> I, we might have to do more than five for that. That <laughs> might be top ten worth. Might have to cut that out of the show, or he's gonna sue us. <laughs> uh, I I won't say what I was going to. But yeah, he but says th this... uh, you're long okay. absent from live shows, listeners. Staff Sergeant Sketch. Well, thanks for sending that to us, man. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, so absolutely. Much. No, good to good to hear from you. But definitely check out I am Eight Bits website. They have some really good stuff on there. Yeah. Let's see. Our next story comes to us from. I don't know why this ad popped up. Do 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 do. Uh, let's see. It's making me sign in. Really? To Am to Amazon. Um, that's weird. Yeah, that, that is weird. That is not <laughs> not right. Let me look up the news uh, first. Oh, shout out, shout out to uh, Donner Party for top five Charles Martinez. Wahoo! Yes. <laughs> All right, uh, let's see. Here we go. Uh, let's see if we can read it here on MSN.com. Let's see. Hold on. Hold on. Live stuff here, everybody. Let me do, do, do. <laughs> let me post yeah, this in okay. the, in the uh, here. Let me post this for you right there. Okay, stand by. Let's see. We'll do the old copy. We'll do the old paste. There we go. From MSN.com, Apple boosts the first emulator to launch on the App Store in a decade. It took only a decade, but Apple finally relaxed the App Store rules regarding retro game console emulators. Comically, the first Apple-approved emulator to launch under the relaxed rules called IGBA was panned by Apple just days after its launch due to copyright infringement. I wonder who was responsible for hmm. that. Uh, the emulator IGBA was a knockoff of GBA 4 iOS, an open source Game Boy Advance emulator that the developer created over 10 years ago. Since it was the only emulator available on the App Store during its short reign, it quickly rose to the top of the App Store charts following the news that emulators were back in town. Representatives for Apple didn't immediately respond for a request for comment. I think we know what happened. <laughs> yeah. Uh, does it rhyme with Nintendo? <laughs> this ain't an Agatha Christie mystery novel. Yeah, and I, I know it's hard to do emulators because you don't want to have emulators pop up on the App Store and then have, you know roms on there that don't belong to them but there's so much um there's so much out there that if you have an emulator and you have like nintendo sega atari whoever 
allow certain, you know, them to go and purchase these titles, like license these titles, you can make money on this stuff again. Why are they, why do they hate taking our money? They, they just want this stuff shut down. Why are they trying so hard to get this stuff shut down? Joey says it perfectly. Maybe Nintendo should take notice of this and release their own. Why? The emulator they shut down not too long ago, why not just go to them and say, hey, we're going to buy you. <laughs> Will you sell to us? Because if you don't, we'll sue you out of existence. So either, A, you can uh, be shut down and be sued to death, or you can sell us you know, this... Uh, uh, this software or whatever it is and we're going to use it for all of our old back catalog and you get a nice chunk of change out yeah. of it you already did all the hard work you don't even have to do the work nintendo the work has yeah. already been done uh, also shout out to joey for saying that i did a wahoo better than any of martinez so i will gladly take that as a compliment nice <laughs> maybe you should be mario's next voice uh I, I'll, yeah, I would love that. And Joey's right I was trying there to think with of us. something says, witty, but let them buy the emulator and hire the devs. Why not? Because it makes too much sense. I guess so. we're just gonna. That's keep why going. they're not. That's why they're not gonna do it. We're we're just gonna bitch about this every single week <laughs> <laughs> until we're old men and, and still yelling. I'm gonna be in my grave, and you're gonna hear me yelling through six feet of dirt, going, "Nintendo, damn you!" Uh, we should just make this a weekly segment now, like play a little soundbite, <laughs> maybe like do some compilations of our best rants. Yeah. I wonder if, uh, if there's anybody out there that uh, if you could go back to all of our old episodes and just pull out every Nintendo rant and just put it all in a compilation and, and we'll just do one whole episode of just Nintendo rants. Uh, that would make a great episode to release during like the week of Christmas because <laughs> we would. usually take that week off. Be like, here, yeah. here's your Christmas present. <laughs> All Nintendo us rants. Whining, us whining about <laughs> Nintendo. Um, now it is time for This Month in Video Game History. <laughs> On April 26th of 1996, Ancient releases The Legend of Oasis for the Sega Saturn in Japan. It's a prequel to the Genesis Zelda-style action game Beyond Oasis. This sounds very intriguing. Yeah, when I looked up a little bit of gameplay, it intrigued me. And I'm thinking, mm. like, we we haven't reviewed any Saturn games, I don't think. Um, I think I did. No, I did uh, Crazy Taxi, I think, and um, the Marvel versus Capcom. I think I did. Did. I'm going to have to go back and look through our archives and see. But this will be a fun one to review. I mean, th this looks like a game that, honestly, I think both of us would like. Oh, wait, I'm not, I didn't do Saturn games. I did Dreamcast games. Ah, Joey's yeah. going to punch me for that. <laughs> as as we wait for the comment. What can I, I mean, it's, it, it, it's easy to get them mixed up. April 30th of 19... Yeah, he says those were good yeah. casts. <laughs> April 30th, 1998, Bomberman Hero is released for the Nintendo 64 in Japan. I don't think we've given Bomberman enough love on this show. Like, I know we talk about him every now and then, but yeah. I just... I've never played any of the games minus the the ones... The one with Wario. You know what we should do? We should do like a Bomberman um, dual review kind of retrospective one week and just review all the Bombermans going back to uh, the arcade and just see okay. how they've evolved through the years. We don't have to play like hours of it, but you know, just jump in and play play a few minutes of them here and there and just see how they've evolved. Because I love the yeah. Bomberman, you know, that, that game type. Yeah, it's basically like a, a Bomberman appetizer platter. Yeah. You just take a little bit of the arcade, then you take a little bit of Wario Blast, a mm -hmm. little bit of everything. Yeah. I like that idea. Uh, in April of 2003, Pan-European Pan Game Information, the PEGI, a European video game content rating system, comes into use. It's interesting to see the different rating system mm -hmm. over in Europe compared to here because they they rate, again, specific age groups. 
So you have the rating of three, which means that it says here the game should not contain any sounds or pictures that are likely to frighten young children. Hmm. A very mild form of violence in a comical context or a childlike setting is acceptable. No bad language should be heard. Yeah, they have, have like a color system on theirs. Yeah, they have 7, 12, 16, 18, and the the dreaded exclamation point. <laughs> Never, the exclamation you don't want point that X. says, no. Uh, in addition to age ratings, there's a special rating represented by an exclamation point labeled parental guidance recommended. These contents are available for all ages, but is recommended that parents, mostly with children who are under the age of 18, supervise activities with the program. Hmm. How bad does a game have to be that you have to monitor a 17-year-old? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> um, I mean, I was playing like Resident Evil when I was like 17, so I don't know. Joey says, top five letters of the English alphabet from A through E. <laughs> now we're just hitting the bottom of the barrel on top of Well, <laughs> obviously D is my number one. Yeah. Like, I feel like it has to be. <laughs> uh, that's great. April 20th of 2004, Hitman Contracts is released for Windows, PS2, and Xbox in North America. I have not played a second of any Hitman game. I was just about to say the same thing. That I should, I should uh, reveal to the world now that I have never played a single second of a Hitman game. I remember the movie that did, was it Timothy Oliphant. Yeah, in the Hitman movie. I think he was in the first. Wasn't there like three of them? Three movies. I but think he, so. He was in the first one, and then they changed in the sequels. Yeah. Mm, never but saw like, the I, movie either. <laughs> I don't really know anything about the Hitman franchise. I remember for a minute they were they were pretty popular because oh, I yeah. remember seeing like commercials for them on TV. But I, I was into other games at that point. So. I think the thing is, is, there's a lot of stealth in those games, and I hate stealth games. I, that yeah, that's that's fair. But before we go into the review tonight, Derek. Would you do the honors of doing our Patreon shout-outs? Sure. As always, we'd like to shout out our fantastic patrons over at patreon.com slash nerdcaveretro. We want to shout out our newest patron, Brian Piotrowski, Nick W., Eld the Zombie, Yup Fed, a.k.a. Knife, James, a.k.a. at Jimbo Jr. on Discord, Raven, Danny House, Justin Nispel, John West, Daniel Salmon, Mr. B Res Coffee himself, Mike Eveland, Tyler Watson, Axblade 07, RMS Jackson, Carlos Longoria, aka I am the Rampage, Rampage, Rampage. Staff Sergeant Sketch, Gus and Penny, Matthew Salmon, Mr. Joey Image, and of course, Mama Diamond. Donna Diamond, thank you all so much for your continued contributions and keeping the lights on for us here at the Nerd Cave Retro Podcast. And for as little as a dollar a month, that's cheaper than a pack of Juicy Fruit that we made that revelation <laughs> last week. Yep. You get your own RSS feed. And if you use Downcast like I do, it'll say uh, Derek Diamond's RSS feed for Nerd Cave Retro. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Because you feel like that was built just for you. Mm -hmm. And it was. So you get your own RSS feed, no ads, just us talking from start to finish. And you get early access to our bonus episodes, which for the most part includes a commentary track from various animated shows like Real Ghostbusters, Tailspin, Chippendale Rescue Rangers. We've also done commentaries for full-length movies like Batman 89, Transformers the movie, the infamous live-action <laughs> Super Mario Brothers movie, Yee. which uh, <laughs> was on TV a while back, and my wife stumbled upon it. It was like, this says Super Mario Brothers, but this, this isn't it. And I'm like, <laughs> no. <"Nah." laughs> you know what I just like, found out the other day? Uh, this thing about Max Headroom popped up on my YouTube. I didn't know the people that created Max Headroom are the same people that wrote the, and directed the Super Mario Brothers movie from back then. Really? Yeah. I did not know that. I didn't know that either. 
learn something new every day. Uh, do we do we want to reveal what we're gonna do for commentary track this month? Why not? Because we're we're gonna get it. Uh, we got to get a, a date for us to actually do it. We're we're gonna do it in the next week or so. But yes, please tell everybody what we're gonna be doing. So uh, we've we've been on a, a bit of a wrestling kick, you know, with WrestleMania mm-hmm. just happening and everything. So we thought, what better way to continue that than with the the Hulk Hogan starring epic <laughs> Suburban Commando? <laughs> and it'll be my first viewing too. So you'll be hearing my first initial thoughts about them. Is is before we do that, I have to ask: Is this the one where the dude straight up murders a dog in the background while he's on a motor while the Hulk is driving by on a motorcycle and some guy in the back? in the background just hucks a dog into, the, into like the river or something. I can't remember that specifically. It's been a long time since I've seen it, but um, hopefully that's not the case. Cause then I'll get really upset. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so be on the lookout Commando. for that. Ooh, it's going to be fun. Yeah. Over the next week or so. So be on the lookout for that. But if you want to sign up, head over to patreon.com slash nerdcaveretro. And for new patrons, send us your social media info, whether it's Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram, so we can give you a proper shout out. And tonight I'm going to be talking about... is an adventure platform video game developed and published by Konami for the NES. It was released on March 18, 1987 in Japan, November in North America, and on December 19, 1988 in Europe. It is a sequel to a prior Goonies video game released on the Famicom in Japan, which was only available in North America on Nintendo vs. System arcade units. And I didn't even know until recently that there was an original Goonies game that was developed. I had no by, idea either. I, why did that not come out in America? Is what I want to know. Uh, who knows? Like, I'm, I'll be honest. When you told me you were going to be reviewing this game, I had no idea that it existed because I was like, okay, there's not a Goonies two movie. Not to say there can't be a Goonies two game. But it just the title alone intrigued me. Well, the thing was, is I, because we never got an original Goonies game in America, it was kind of, conf- I remember it being kind of confusing when I was a kid, because I remember this game coming out, and I was intrigued by it. I never played it, but I, you know, re- remember reading some reviews or something, or had some friends that, you know, said it wasn't that great of a game. But it was sort of like, is it? The Goonies, like, it, it, you know, it's the same font. It, it sort of looks like Mikey on the front cover. And you read the synopsis of the game and you're like, yes, it's a, you're still, you know, a, going up against the Fratellis and all that kind of stuff. So it's kind of like, I, I don't know if this is going to be any good because it's not about the movie. Like, I've never seen a video game sequel to a movie before. Like, why not put out a video game about the movie. It was all just weird. Yeah, and you can get into potentially really tricky space with that because when you take a a cult classic that's beloved like The Goonies and then you make a sequel video game, you're like, okay, where where's this going? Like, <laughs> I could see a lot of Goonies fans that might be gamers that would be like, I don't know if I like this. Yeah. I mean, it would make more sense if they if they had put out the the Goonies game in America and then put out a video game sequel. It would have been like, oh, okay, well, there's a sequel to the first game. There's no movie, but you know, there's a sequel. Cool, I'm gonna play that. But um, the, the, some of the notes I wrote about this game, I started playing it last week, and you can definitely tell <clears throat> that this is a Konami game. So you can definitely tell that some of the people that worked on the original Ninja Turtles game. For Ultra, which is, you know, quote unquote Konami, because of all the weird stuff that Nintendo did, all these companies could only technically release three games per year. So what companies like Konami would do is create subsidiaries like Ultra and release more games 
under a subsidiary name. So all those developers were the same. You know, you know, they which, all worked for under Konami. Which, if you have a good developer like Konami, why would you not want them to put out more games? Yeah. Because they're going to sell because chances are it's going to be good. Yeah. I mean, I know Nintendo kind of wanted to not flood the market, kind of like uh, what happened with the Atari 2600. They kind of wanted to squash that. And I get it. Um, but they, you know, they had an easy workaround. They're like, oh, well, we got six games we want to release this year. So let's just release these three under uh, Ultra, <laughs> you know, quote unquote Ultra, uh, which is nothing to do with Konami, nothing to see here. But we all knew it was the same thing. Um, and one of the things about this is uh, the thing I noticed about this game is, is it definitely fell in that time. Like this did come out in uh, 87 uh, in America. So this is right in that weird spot of the sequel era, I call it, uh, for the Nintendo where you had, you know, Castlevania 2, Simon's Quest. You had um, uh, uh, Legend of Zelda, Adventure of Link. You know, Zelda 2 came out, and they were doing different things. Like, they were trying to make games that were not just a straight-up, um, you know, side-scroller or whatever. Like, they were trying to do different things. So, you see games like The Goonies, and this is, um, it says here in the article, it's considered an early example of an exploration platform game, which is basically just say it's a Metroidvania where there's a lot of backtracking, there's a lot of, um, the maps are kind of short, but and this, I know this is going to sound weird, so I'm going to try to explain this best way I can. You move from map to map by going through these rooms where you're going as a side-scroller, and then you go in these rooms, and sometimes you can punch a wall, and there will be a, uh, a door will appear, or you go into a room, there's already a door, and you go forward through that door, you'll come out on another map, uh, which you start out like in a warehouse, and then you go through a door, and you go through the other door, and then you're on basically like in a cave. <laughs> like you, and there's also warp zones too, where there's rooms you go in, and there's these old, you know, bearded old man with a, you know, uh, what do they call those things, those shepherd uh, hooks? <laughs> you know, he's standing there, he's like, hey young man this is a warp zone uh, and then you go through there and you just come out on another map somewhere and the maps aren't very long but there's the part the the thing about this game is there's a lot of going into rooms hitting walls you know finding secrets finding objects that you need to get through the game so there's a lot a lot of backtracking in this game so it requires a lot of memorization of where you are and where you need to go back to would you say there's also a lot of punching yeah <laughs> i accidentally <laughs> i went in this one room and the guy's like oh hey i'll fill your your hey friend i'll fill your uh health meter and so i punched him and he's like ow i'm not gonna fill your health meter now because you punched me <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, screw you i was trying to help you no and i think you hit the nail on the head you know when i was watching back some of the gameplay i felt like this was directly like very similar to the first teenage mutant ninja turtles game mm -hmm. for the nes everything from the way the backgrounds looked yep. not exactly the same but you can yeah obviously tell the the influence yeah the artists Which, like, are, I, this this was yeah. like where the artists started here and then took what they learned and then went and made the seat the you know the levels for ninja turtles yeah yeah so i i think this could definitely be looked at as you know kind of the blueprint mm -hmm. for for ninja turtles oh yeah and i don't think that's a bad thing like it, it doesn't look like a bad game at all like it mm -mm. graphic wise i think it it looks pretty good yeah the um the character designs could be a little better, but I mean... That was one of my complaints. That, that, is like the game, the backgrounds all look great, but Mikey himself, you play Mikey in the game, he just looks so bland. Like there's nothing... I don't know. It's like they didn't take any time to, uh, I don't know, make a cool character model. He's just so... He's just... Plan. He looks like a typical suburban kid that you'd find. Yeah, I like mean, down the street. Nothing cool. Like as a video game character, there's nothing cool about him. 
Yeah, Nick W. Um, he uh, AVGN did review this a couple of weeks ago, and I, I didn't want people to think that I'm I reviewed this because of AVGN. Like this has been on my list for a while. Plus, this was part of the the poll I put up a while back on Patreon for for what I'm well, the games I'm going to review. Um, but I did watch his video, and he makes some good points. Like, and one of the things that I I, I feel about this game is it tries to do. There's good ideas in this game, but the the problem with this game, especially when you go into like the uh, first person sort of point and click areas of this game, it's a little unwieldy because of the limitations of the controller. I mean, you're only working with you know the original NES controller. You've got a select button, a start button, and BA. Not a lot there to work with when you're trying to flip through items and do this and that, point and click and do all this type of stuff. And I emulated this game. When I emulate these games in my emulator, I use a, 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 um, a Super Nintendo controller all the time because I just like Super Nintendo controllers. And so I'm so used to modern gaming and like knowing that the Super Nintendo controller is the blueprint for everything that came afterwards. I kept trying to hit the other buttons on the Super Nintendo controller because I would think, oh, well, I need to go to a menu. So I would hit, you know, the, the X or Y button or whatever. Like, oh, that button doesn't do anything because it didn't exist at the time. So if they would have made this game, like did a remake of this on the Super Nintendo, I think it would have been a lot easier easier to you to play well i'm bringing up the the point and click portions of the game like i get it and i haven't played it so i can't speak on it from an actual playing perspective but watching it it seemed kind of jarring to it, be it honest is. like you, you have your side scroller and then you enter this point and click area and it's just like okay now we we go from what's an NES game and now I feel like I'm in a, a PC game mm. that I'm playing at school and I just I didn't feel like it meshed too well. Yeah and I give them credit for, for trying new things because right. they took you know the, the point and click part of the game is very reminiscent of what would come later with games like Shadowgate and uh, the Uninvited things like that. You can do point and click stuff on the the NES but when you have an early version of it like this, it's just kind of unwieldy. And ve like you said, it's very jarring to go from a side scroller, you know, uh, kind of a beat em up, not really a beat em up, but just a side scrolling platformer. And you go into this room and now you're in a first person perspective. And I feel like this game uh, and also falls in the same category as uh, Friday the 13th, where I feel like. There were great ideas there. It was just the limitations of the hardware is what really held those games back. You know, that actually would be a a good top five list. <laughs> top five games we'd like to see get a remake. Yeah. Honestly, I was thinking about this a lot lately. What if there were a Goonies game? out today that's sort uh, sort of a not really uh, an open world kind of game maybe an on rail sort of thing like uh, uncharted or something like that i would play the hell out of it because i think that would be really cool to go around you know chasing one-eyed willie's treasure and all the underground caverns and going on adventures as a goonie would be pretty awesome yeah and we've talked about i mean we do a podcast about it but nostalgia sells and I think if you did make a an Uncharted style game, but you put it in the Goonies universe, mm -hmm. I think you get a decent amount of people that would buy it. Like it was a really popular movie. People still talk about it. People love it, and I I think it it has the right universe to make a fun adventure game. And imagine if you were playing a Goonies game and you had like like a three part a three person party system where you could switch in between characters. And you go to somebody, like, if you have a, uh, you got to traverse something or, you know, there's like a puzzle to solve. So you go to data and you have all these different, uh, you know, gadgets and things that you can use. Or you go over to, to Bran, who's sort of like the tank 
you know, uh, like he's very strong, like he can fight or something like that. It's just sort of like every every goonie kind of has their their. I, I, what would you call it? Like their own kind of their uh, skill set. Yeah, skill set throughout the game would be kind of awesome. I'd play it. I think it's a good idea. So, you know, if you're out there, Konami, you could come back with a new Goonies game and I'd buy it from you. Uh, just just let throw that out there. I think a lot of other people would too. And uh, some of my other notes here, um, uh, I, it does play very similar to uh, TMNT, but the thing that is different from this game, from that game, is there's no knockback with Mikey. Like, you just... You hit an enemy and it just takes off some, makes you blink for a second and takes off some health. So it's not one of those games where you try to make a jump and an enemy will all of a sudden appear and hit you and then you fly like eight feet backwards and land in water or fall through you know a bottomless pit or whatever. I hated that quality, but at the same time, <laughs> I thought it was kind of cool. Yeah. Sometimes in some games it does have you can use it to your advantage. Like right. games like Ninja Gaiden, you can use it to boost yourself to places you couldn't normally get to. So in some games it works, but a game like this, it actually took me a while to get used to it because I kept fully expecting to like jump over a chasm and hit an enemy and it would just knock me back into the hole. And it took me a while to like get used to that because I'm so used to it in every other game. Yeah, I haven't played too many games with the bounce back, at least from, from what I can remember. The only one I can think of is TMNT. Yeah, uh, the music of the game is really good. Of course, I mean, it's a Konami game. As you heard at the beginning there, they do a chiptune version of Goonies Are Good Enough, which is which made me happy to hear that. It's pretty great. And each level has its own separate music, so it doesn't get um, overplayed. Uh, like some games where they'll just play the same music throughout the whole game, but it's it's got some uh, it's got a lot of variety as far as music. Um, game does not really have a walkthrough. I was gonna try to use a walkthrough to get through this game, um, but it's such a mishmash of different styles of game. That I think it's kind of hard to do a, a walkthrough of this game. I mean, I went to do a walkthrough and it was just basically like. Um, get the hammer and you can punch the back walls, but use the hammer to hit the wall, the ceiling, the floor and the side walls. And, and it was just like, good luck basically. <laughs> so I don't know if, if I don't think it, that the items that you get in each room are randomized, but they might be sort of, um, like three or four different, uh, variations of where they're at. I'm not sure. I, I can't speak to it cause I haven't played the game more than once. So it could be one of those things where every time you start the game, your items might be in a different spot to sort of get more replay out of the game. Because once you would, a game like this, once you know where everything is, it's sort of like you could go through it pretty quick, I feel like. But I, I also feel I, if they did do something like that where things are you know, in a different spot every time, that would definitely give it some replay value. Yeah, I think so too. And like I said, the puzzles aren't really puzzles. It's more like just you bang on walls and stuff and you try to do different things around the rooms to make things appear. Things that, you know, are helpful on your journey as you go around. You And the point of the game is the Fratellis have kidnapped all the other Goonies, so you got to go rescue all of your friends. And then, of course, the end of the game is... <coughs> and I, I know this is a spoiler, a spoiler for a... 30 something year old game but somehow Mikey is friends with a mermaid and the mermaid got uh abducted by the Fratellis so that's the whole point of the game is to free your friends and your mermaid friend at the end of the game and the Fratellis get arrested again that is an interesting twist though with a like who doesn't like a mermaid yeah i mean it could have thrown in the missing octopus from the act from the movie yeah that would have been a, a cool, a cool little nod. Yeah, I didn't even think of that. And we we talked about it. I mean, this game could absolutely be remade today. You could do it like we said. You could do uh, you know an Uncharted style 
sort of on rails adventure game where you're solving puzzles and things like that. But you could also do, you know, up to an updated point and click game like the Walking Dead series. I think that could work as well. I think so too. I, I think if you, I feel like it'd have to be one or the other though. Yeah. I, I, I don't, I wouldn't do mm -hmm. the, the mix up like you no. did with the original version. I mean, it, like, like we said, like I said, it was a good idea and it's it's a very early version of of them just trying things, you know, different playing styles to see what they could do differently. And of you know, you see that era of the Nintendo, and those games aren't necessarily beloved, but they the the more you kind of look back on it through today's lens, you kind of see what they were trying to do, so you appreciate them a little bit more. Like I I still hate. Um, the adventure of Link, but I get what they were trying to do. Simon's right. Quest has grown on me over the years. I hated that game when I was a kid. Now that I'm older and I understand what it is they were trying to do, it's very much more easier to go back and appreciate that game for the things that it did. And Joey agrees with us. Goonies in an Uncharted slash Tomb Raider style would be awesome. Yep, it would be. I would play it. <laughs> I would oh, definitely 100%. play that. Yeah, that'd be great. And uh, let's see. Um, I, my whole life, I thought I would hate this game, but I absolutely have no problems with it. I actually enjoy it. It's definitely a game to pick up if you have the time to put into it. It's definitely not a straightforward, you know, jump in and do a side scroller for a couple of hours and you're done. This takes a lot of memorization and and sort of exploration and like the Metroidvania style of finding an item and then being like, okay, well now I got to go back to this other place because the dude needs the, the dude I talked to in this room needs this thing I found. So where was that room at again? You know, so you got to kind of play the game and and get an idea of of you know sort of start to memorize the map a little bit because the map it feels a little overwhelming that's that's the thing about the game it feels a little overwhelming when you first jump into it which is a little surprising from an nes game but i do i do enjoy this game and i really think i would have liked it as a kid if i'd known how the game was played <clears throat> i do feel like it's kind of cryptic on what you're supposed to do in the game and i think that's why people didn't like it at the time and I think as a kid, I probably wouldn't have liked it so much because I didn't, I wouldn't have understood, you know, what all needed to be done in the game in order to get through it. But as a, I just wish I had the time that I had when I was a kid to just play this game now because I would spend a lot of time just playing this game, having fun with it. Yeah, you're you're preaching to the choir about that. I'd love to <laughs> have that time back. But when it comes down to it, out of a uh, out of ten, I would give it probably a seven. I'll give it a seven. It's not bad. It's not great. It it does a lot of different things and wasn't great at the things it tried to do. But like I said, it falls in that category of the games like Friday the Thirteenth, where they had good ideas that just the hardware wasn't there yet. And it, but it's, it's still stuff, not a bad score, though. Yeah, but it's stuff that you know they laid the groundwork for what would come later in gameplay. So you got to give these games credit for what they did at the time. You got to start somewhere. But that's going to bring us to the end of the review. And um, so next week, um, we are going to do another top five. And this week we we put up a asked our patrons what kind of top fives we should do, and I think the one we settled on was from Mister I am the Rampage himself suggested we do top five shoot 'em ups shmups if you will so shmups I like that send us your top five shoot 'em ups for next Monday's episode and I am throwing in uh, in the shoot 'em up category. Um, like top-down shooters, like 1941, Galaga, um, uh, even things like Gunsmoke even fall into this category for uh, for us here at Nerd Cave yeah. Retro. We'll call it a shmup because I plan on throwing some of those in my list. 
That's what we should just call the episode, Top 5 Shmups. That's what I'm going to call it. Not Shmucks. Shmups. <laughs> Shmups. But, uh, but yeah, so send us your list, Top 5 shoot 'em ups for next uh, next Monday. NerdCaveRetro at gmail.com. Send them to us, and we'll read them on the show. Love a good Top 5 list. So, Derek, speaking of Top 5 lists, how did uh, how was your Top 5 list for this Derek Diamond experience this week? It was a lot of fun. Uh, we did a list that uh, I was really excited to do for a long time. Top five movie soundtracks. And it. I went down a rabbit hole on YouTube going through <laughs> like the best movie soundtracks of all time. Because like I knew my, my top two, but it was just finding the other three and then figuring out where I wanted to rank them. And you got a, a pretty decent turnout as far as list submissions. Mm -hmm. So... If you want to go check that out, it's at linktree.com slash D Diamond Podcast. And I did kind of, from my list, I did kind of break the rule a little bit because there's a difference. Everybody should know there's a difference between soundtrack and scores. But I do feel like the original Star Wars soundtrack, I have the uh, the old box set that they produced back in the like late 80s, early 90s or whatever. Um, because Star Wars doesn't have a soundtrack, I feel like it, should have it, it could be considered a score or a soundtrack i respect that now now that you explain it like it it makes sense yeah so that that's why yeah. i threw it in mind i mean there's yeah. plenty of other soundtracks i could have thrown in there but i'm proud of that box set you know how much that thing goes for these days that's a lot but i wouldn't but i wouldn't sell it though like no. that'd be something i would keep oh no i would never sell i mean i might have to sell it you know to when I'm almost dying or something and I need money, I might have to sell it, but I'm not going to sell it before then. I can tell you that. Yeah, for sure. And uh, for this week's open micers at open micers on Twitter and Instagram, uh, we had a debate who was better David Bowie or kid rock. So please go check out the show at open micers. Uh, Ziggy Stardust versus Bawa Daba. Yeah, it was uh, it was interesting. So go. Check I haven't it out. listened to it yet, but I'm I'm excited to. <laughs> I got a lot of clips to pull out of that episode. <laughs> but uh, but thank you all for hanging out with us. And uh, anything else before we get out of here this week? I think that's it. Let's walk out the door. If you want to email us, email us at nerdcaveretro at gmail.com. And nerdcaveretro.com takes you to our link tree. That takes you to all of our socials, ways to give us money. If you don't want to be a patron, we have a Cash App and PayPal button up there. That's, we have our uh, Patreon and merch shop up there. And if you want to go to our merch shop, it's ncrmerch.com. We have t-shirts, hats, stickers, magnets, bags, mugs, whatever your nerdy heart desires. Let me tell you. We've been selling a lot of uh, Master Blaster Runs Barter Town t-shirts. We sell a lot of those. So if you want to get one of those, that's where you need to go, ncrmerch.com. Follow us on social media, at Nerd Cave Retro. And, of course, if you don't have any money to give us, leave us a review and or a five-star rating on all podcasting platforms. Derek, please tell them what it's all about. May the way of the hero lead to the Triforce. Yeah. And that's an episode. It, that that was the perfect clip to end it on. Yeah, well, it I had know. to happen. I had to look, scroll through my, <laughs> my thing, like, where is it? Where is it? <laughs> you got it though, so it, it all worked out. But yeah, uh, Chuck said the Sci Fi Book Club sold the the Star Wars box set soundtrack. Let me just, out of just sheer curiosity, I have eBay pulled up. Let me look up the Star Wars trilogy. Uh, CD CD box set. Uh, let's see. Oh man, these things went down in price. Well, I mean, people are asking like two hundred dollars our best offer, um, forty dollars with zero bids. So I I don't know. These things are kind of all over the place. That's not surprising. But it does come with a really cool book in it that um, talks about, you know, the movies and John Williams and all that kind of stuff. So if you could get your hands on one, it's really cool to have. I bought it when I worked at a record store 
back in the 90s, and I got it. It was used, so, but it was perfect. And I think they gave the guy like 15 bucks for it, and then I was like, well, I'm going to put 15 bucks in the register and take it for myself. So I think I got it for like $15 back in the day. Oh, you know that guy that sold it has to be sick. Oh, I'm sure. That's what we used to do when we worked at the record store. We'd give people like as little as possible, (laughs) like GameStop for their used CDs. And then we'd turn around and just pay, you know, whatever we gave them, uh, whatever we gave them for it. So it was like the money, the poor shop never made any money. So I guess that's why they eventually went out of business. Uh, you take the good with the bad. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But I got a lot of CDs that way. (laughs) Yeah. But uh, but that's going to do it for this week. Thank you, everybody, for hanging out with us. And uh...